chapter 20, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 20. Be a warp speed today. Got a lot to cover. Acts, the 20th chapter. We'll start in verse 35. Uh, a lot of things going on in our nation. You know, I often look at the headlines. Uh, my pastor's pastor, A.D. Van Hoos, once said to me over a chicken fried steak, he said, preach the headlines, preacher. He told me two things I'll never forget because I took him out. He's an elderly man. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. And I said, hey, uh, Pastor A.D., what, what would you have me do when I start pastoring? He said, first, look at the headlines. He said, God's always talking to us through the headlines. He said, also, I want you to always keep the church pulling forward. And he used this phrase, a pulling mule can't kick. And I thought to myself, what do you mean a pulling mule can't kick? He said, any business, any church, any family that's moving forward often don't fight. They won't fight each other as long as you're pulling towards something. But if you quit pulling towards something, the old adage you heard me say for many years, when you're not fishing, you're fighting. Amen. So you got to keep fishing. you got to keep pulling towards something in life, whether family or business or church. And I thought it was tremendous advice over a chicken fried steak that I had to pay for to get the advice for. But I love I loved that man, you know, and he taught my pastor. My pastor's taught me a lot of stuff. And, and so I, I'm, I'm looking around and saying, Lord, what's going on? And, and then I saw that headlines, San Francisco shoplifting surge. And I was blown away because I've been to San Francisco a couple times. It's a beautiful city. But here it hit me that you, you have to steal at least $950 worth of merchandise from a place in order to even be registered as above a, a misdemeanor. A, the theft is so bad that 17 Walgreens have already closed their doors. 17 well, in San Francisco alone because they said, we can't afford to keep letting people walk in. A lady was shopping, a new resident, and she actually asked when she saw people loading up stuff and walking, not running, but walking out of the store, she looked at the uh, a cashier and she said, excuse me, is it optional to pay for things here? I just want to know, I'm a new resident here in San Francisco, is it optional to pay for things? I was with Andre and Dirk, and, uh, who are South Africans who, who attend our church, and I, I, I was talking to them, Durban, South Africa, where I've been and preached, they have literally walked through the malls, the malls, now not just the store, but the malls, and stripped them clean, Brian, just took everything out of them and looted everything without any uh, opposition of the police or the people around them. They did it again in Johannesburg. And so this thing keeps escalating and snowballing. And I'm thinking to myself, first off, I thank God for Texas because I don't see a lot of that happening to, uh, among us uh, gun-toting folk around here. Amen. I mean, it's not that we're going to shoot you for stealing mascara, but we might nick you. You know what I'm saying, Kenny? Because you, know, you just can't do that. But the issue was the, it's, it's, stealing is another way of taking. And if you're not careful, you become involved in those that take instead of those that give. And so I, I asked the Lord, I'm out mowing grass, and, and, and I start tearing up because as I'm moving around the property, I realize that the people that have left my life and what you'll see on the board in the back, uh, what they did here matters there. It was the givers. And I don't want to be carnal or fleshly here, but the truth of the matter is, you know who I miss the most that had been in my life over the last 40 years of serving Jesus? It was the givers. It wasn't the takers. It was those who gave. And not just gave of finances, Donald, because I remember you and Patsy being out on, I got to be careful naming names because I'll go all day. But, but the bottom line is those who gave of time, those who gave forgiveness in my life, those who poured in love, those who have been volunteering over the, over the years that have taken care of myself. And so I, just being a little fleshly here, I, I said, Lord, it's the, it's the givers I miss. It's not the takers. The takers came and took what they could and then died. But then there are those, and by the way, nobody resurrects a statue to takers. Amen. But those who gave, those who were a blessing and other, and so I said, God, I thank you that I pastor a church full of givers. Can I get an amen? Because I love this house. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. If you've got it, are you comfortable? Paul said, and Paul had been with the, uh, the Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, started the church there, and he'd been with some elders for about three years, 36 months. After those three years, he decided it's time for me to go. And so this is on his voyage over toward Rome, and he ends up on the Isle of Melita. You remember he gets bit by the snake. He shakes it off and all those. This is right before that. He said, I showed you all things, how that's so laboring, you ought to support the weak. In other words, get a job. 
And remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Again, when givers leave us, it's a painful farewell. It's tough, man. Because they've been a part of our lives, and they poured into our lives, and they spoke wisdom into our lives. But when I see this, there are, in this world that we live in, the ever-living battle of two supernatural beings. And I know that God is all-powerful and Satan is not, but beware of this. He has his play on this earth. And when I read about him, and I pick up some things about him, amen, I understand the confrontation is, is displayed on the prophetic backdrop of a preordained strategy. God has... God sees things Satan never saw. Satan never saw where the seed was going to be hid and where Jesus was coming to crush his head. He never saw that. But the issue is, now that he's on this earth and has been here, we realize that we have these differences in people. And one of the great marks of a believer is the ability to release and be a giver. Amen. In the people's life. And what we've done over the years, because of the abuse of the pulpit, we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And we have began to get to a place in our life where we go, well, you know, this preacher, he, you know, I've often said this, you can shear a sheep a lot, but you can only skin one once. And a lot of people got skinned. Amen. They've been hurt. And because of that, we threw the, ba the baby out with the bathwater, and we forget that the real issues in our life is learning to be givers. And when I leave this planet, I, I hope somebody says, you know, it mattered that he was here that he did something while he was here. And that's what I want for everybody in this house, a legacy. Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, just open it up. Let the word be the word. Let the preacher get out the way. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Again, I'm going to be, be moving pretty quick here. But one of the things you realize is the difference in the givers and takers, one is love and the other is hate. Most folk that actually are takers are haters. Amen. They, they hate their life. They hate what's been given to them. They look at their life different than others, and so they begin to take. Amen. One functions as light. The other has his deeds done in darkness. One has come to provide life and more abundantly. The other has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. This is what we realize about Satan. One has come to bless, the other to bruise. Jesus came here to bless us. Can I get an amen? And Satan, of course, is bruising. When you really narrow down the specifics of their characteristics, you will find over and over again, one gives, the other one takes. When you look around, you will actually find that there are really only two kinds of people in this world. John chapter 10, 10 talks about the origin, amen, of where it started from. Jesus said the thief, and you call it the thief, you call him the devil, you can call him Satan, you can call him Lucifer, you can call him Beelzebub. I love Beelzebub because Beelzebub actually means Lord of the flies. Not just any flies, but the great big green flies that fly over dung. Do I need to translate the word dung for y'all? Y'all country enough know what that means? All them green flies over that? Beelzebub means Lord of those flies. I love that. It puts Satan in the right place. Amen. That's where he's at. But he came to, the scripture says, not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. So before creation, and we'll back you up some, give you a little. You know, some people are always talking about theology. I wish I knew a little more theology. If you'll listen to what I'm saying to you, there's theology in every sermon I preach. Amen. A little bit deeper all the time. Watch this. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven. Isaiah prophetically seeing the fallen of Lucifer. O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. So I'm reading this, and you pick up that you know, to understand that Satan, one time in heaven, decided he was going to push his throne above the Father. He was going to dethrone God and take over in heaven. That is a taking mentality. That is a seizing mentality. And that's what he wanted to do. So he tries to rise up. Amen. He said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Mm. careful now one thing you not is God so it goes on to say but you are brought down to the grave to the depths of the pit those who see the star uh, stare at you they ponder your fate 
Amen. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? Now, not to be able to go all the way into this, I'll tell you this. Jesus said this. He said, I was there when I saw Satan fall from heaven, like lightning fall from heaven. Now he's on the earth. On the earth, this is what he does. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild animals, and the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, I can't do this unless I do this. Did God say? Yesterday I, I did a wedding in a beautiful facility in uh, uh, Galveston, and they put a mic on me. And so I mic'd up in the back of this beautiful church, and it's packed with a couple hundred people, and I can't help myself. So the music is playing, instrumental music. And I'm going, this instrumental music brought, brought to you by the Bryant at their wedding. And, and people are just. And, and then, and then uh, the, the middle son, uh, the, the brother of the groom, is walking down the aisle, and his pants are really sagging. He's got a phone in one, something, or other, and he's wearing a suit, and he's not used to wearing a suit. And I go, there goes James with a load in his britches. Now, now the crowd's really, and they're really looking now. Where's that voice coming from? Where, where, where? I can't, I can't believe. And, and then, and then the, the mother of the groom, she is dressed to the hilt, man. She's wearing sparkles. And I, I've never, that girl looked fine, boy. And she started walking down the aisle. And I go, there goes the mother of the groom. Isn't she looking sparkly? And all of a sudden, she just stops and starts doing twirls in the middle of the And the whole crowd starts clapping, you know. It was one of those. Just when it, yeah, I had a moment. So when I'm reading this, I see, I see Satan here going, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let me stop here real quick. Did you know when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image? Did you know they already knew that? See, when you forget your identity, you will listen to foreign voices. You already know you're God's child. Amen. You're a son and a daughter of the king. Don't let some devil tell you, amen, that if you do this, you become more like God. You're already like God. You're created in his image. Amen. So don't sit around and listen to a foreign voice tell you something different than that. So here we go. Get back to it. You will not surely die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. By, by the way, every fruit in the garden was good. Every fruit of the garden was pleasing. Every fruit of the garden was mm -mm -mm -mm, pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was what? With her. She, we, we keep throwing this thing at, at, at Eve. Adam was there. He just didn't take his right spot. Amen. He didn't step up as the man. He didn't, he didn't man up and say, get out of here, devil. Amen. Quit talking to my wife. Quit speaking into her ears. But no, he allowed Eve to eat them out of a place at home. Mm. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now we got two kids showing up. One named Cain, the other named Abel. Adam lay with his wife Eve. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain, and said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to, to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Notice the word firstborn. First is very important here. Amen. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, not, uh, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you. you got to master it. What he was trying to teach Cain here is, is there's a right way to give an offering and a wrong way. There's a right way to give, and he gave her the first things. He gave it literally the word is tithe there. Uh, that's what Abel did. 
But Cain got mad. You know what happened. Cain kills Abel. Now, I'm just going to walk you through something here real quick that I've used before for you. But respect is a powerful thing. When jealousy gets out of hand, you got trouble. Respect means to elevate a person. Respect of titles, you know, doctor, pastor, officer, president. I'm always careful about titles. Titles are important. I believe a lot of folk have earned titles. I, I'm, I'm very kind about titles. I think it, it speaks of their, their office in life. Then to admire means to esteem a person, to appreciate their giftings. When it gets out of hand, it's this Cain and Abel thing. To be like them is one thing. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I don't mind you following me. I don't want you to elevate me. I don't want you to put me in a place that I should not be. Let me be Jerry. Let me be pastor. Let me be friend. Let me bro be brother. Amen. Let, let me be uh, that connection with you. But don't elevate me to a place that I can't stand because that's what we do with humans. We put their posters on the wall. We, we elevate them. We elevate politicians. We elevate athletic uh, figures. The truth of the matter is if you really knew them, you probably wouldn't like them. Amen. So be careful about elevating certain people, uh, uh, period. I just say period. So what happens is we elevate folk, and then we begin to emulate them. Amen. We try to equal that person. We, we, we compete. Amen. And when you do that, and ministry can really get into this area. So you have to be careful. I have to be careful when I'm looking on Facebook. I see other churches blowing and going. Amen. Others see us blowing and going, things like that. And they, and they begin to uh, compare. Comparison always demoralizes. When you compare yourself to somebody else, when, when Cain began to compare his offering to Abel's, it demoralized him. It hurt his feelings, and he got mad about it. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eliminate my brother. I'm going to be my brother here. So, so this is when God said, be careful. Sin is crouching at your door. Don't compare yourself to others. I can't compare myself to anyone else. You know, I, I work out. I do things like that. But, again, uh, I, I watch other people. I, there's this old man that comes in where I work out. I look at him, and he, he is buff. He's 10 years older than me. Amen. The bag he carries is heavier than any weight I can lift. Amen. And I, I have to be careful. So I, I'm, I just kind of like, again, stay in your lane, man. Amen. Just, just you be you, and you're going to be fine with that. Be careful. If Cain were able, he would have never killed Abel. If Cain were able, he would have never killed Abel. If he was able to pay attention here, Cain was jealous as he witnessed Abel's joy, the favor of God in his life. Jealousy leads to hatred, hatred to anger, and then murder. Watch that little green monster, man. I'm telling you, they can get all over you. It leads to hatred, anger, then murder. Amen. Eliminating people won't solve your problem. I'll say it again. Eliminating people will not solve your problem. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Be careful with that. Now, Satan's influence over the, the whole nation of Israel. After Jericho's destruction, God said, don't touch Jericho. That's my place. You know what happened? They walked in. They marched around the city seven times, six times. And on the last day, seven times around, 13 laps around the city. Amen. Then they shouted. The walls fell. And the Scripture says, chapter 7, verse 1, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Karma, the son of, of Zebdi, the son of Zeril, of the tribe of Judah, took, man, why do you do that? He took the accursed thing, also known as carom or tithe, amen, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, you know the story, they, uh, I, all my life I've heard, you're aching for a breaking. you aching for a breaking. I thought, what, what does that mean? Here it is, Joshua chapter 7. They took Achan, took his wife, took his children, took his animals, and stoned them to death and left them in a pile of heap because they touched things that were in Jericho. They took silver and they took gold, uh, silver wedges and gold, and took some, uh, um, um, some of them, uh, uh, what do they call them? Suits. Zook suits. Took some suits out of there, some really nice stuff, hid them in his tent, and then God said, look, you got a problem, Josh. I said, that city's for me. That city's for me. So they went in, they touched it. Again, again this is known as the tithe or the carom. Keep walking, preacher. Again, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So then you decide, you know what? I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, but I want everybody to know I'm doing it. I want everybody to know. First off, don't worry about that because nobody really cares. <laughs> but then this thing happened in the New Testament where people were bringing in stuff and putting it at the apostles' feet. They were bringing finances and being a blessing. Well, this couple named Ananias and Sapphira, they saw it. I call this how God strikes a match. 
You ever seen God strike a match? Here it is. Verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it on the apostles' feet. Let me help y'all bring this into the 21st century. Pastor, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give 10%. I heard this so many times. I can do this scratch offs. If I win a lottery, I'm going to give you 10%. Look, you don't give a dime on a dollar. How do I expect you to ever give a 10% if you hit a million? If you don't give a dime on a dollar, you sure ain't going to do that when you really hit it. So, this is what they did. They said, you know what? We're going to sell this land and give it to the church. We're going to take care of some things here in the church. In full knowledge, his wife knew this. He kept back some of the money. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Ghost and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't you? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? It was yours. And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? Sure. What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. You, you gave God a vow that you're going to take care. You're going to do this with the money if you sold it. So here's what we do. We say, God, if I can sell this house for $100,000, you know I'm going to give $10,000. All of a sudden, you sell it for $100,000. You forgot that you prayed that prayer. God answered your prayer, and now you're going to hold back. I didn't expect it to get noisy in here. Watch it. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Had a heart attack right there. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. When the young men came forward, they wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. This is before cell phones. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? So he's going to ask her. She said, yeah, yeah, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? You did lied again. You lied. Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Can you imagine what the offering was the next Sunday? Can you imagine folk giving it up? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. They coming to the, to, the, to the altar, laying that money down, and looking at Peter going, all good here, preacher, all good here, preacher. Amen. I see, because it's something fear gripped you. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, if this happened in the, the church, the early church, imagine if it happened here in the ladder splatter. How it would be like, it would be amazing. But I, I don't, I thank God for grace. Can I get an amen? But if you do so, if you give God a vow, if you tell God you're going to do this and you ask him for help and he blesses you, make sure you follow through with it. Amen. That makes you the giver. Can I get an amen? It's so important. This is why they were doing it, because others were doing it. In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyrus, from the, uh, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which also means the son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I will tell you this. No matter what happens in your life, by the end of your life, make sure you don't leave your stuff to the government, because we already give enough money to the government. Amen. Leave it to the right, leave it to your family, leave it to the church, leave it to a charity, leave it somewhere where others can't get hold of it that you got control over. Can I get an amen? Let's talk about givers real quick. For God so loved the world, he. I said, for God so loved the world, he. For God so loved the world, he. His only begotten son. He created man from the dust of the earth. He breathed life into him. He gave life to him. When you have life, God gave that to you. Ephesians 4, 7 says, but to each one of us, grace has been given. God gave us grace, amen, as Christ apportioned it. You have a grace, I have a grace. This is why it says, when he ascended straight up, amen, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. The ascension took place after his resurrection. So what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? So he went down into the earthly regions, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Amen. It's a little bit of taking now. I'm going to take, actually, I'm going to take back that which belonged to me to start with. 
I'm taking back. I, you, you never, you never own death, and you never own grave, and you never own hell. Amen. That's mine to give. So he took the keys back, and he who descended is the very one who ascended higher, higher, higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Before NASA ascended, before Sir Charles Bronson, uh, Branson ascended, before Bezos. Uh, uh, ascended Jesus ascended higher than the heavens to fill the whole universe Whew. so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors the teachers to equip his people for works of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up God put apostles and prophets an evangelist, he put these gifts, pastors and teachers in your life, amen, to build you up to do the work of the ministry. That's why I say this is a giving church because I've seen, you know, again, let me just say, Joseph Amaray, you did, you want a guitar. Is that what happened? You want a guitar at some drawing and you told God what? If I get this guitar, Lord, I'm putting in a lottery for a guitar. I'm a young girl who's an athlete. I play basketball, make everybody happy in school and volleyball. But if I win this guitar, Lord Jesus, I will lead worship in that youth group with Joseph and all the rest of them. I'm shy. I'm nervous. But if I win the guitar, and you won the guitar, and you kept your promise, and God didn't strike you dead, Aren't you glad you kept your promise now? <laughs> See, you didn't know how God strikes a match, but that's how he does it right there. He'll strike a match down. So that's honoring God with your gifts and your talents. She didn't even know she had that talent. But she took, and many of us, man, we tell God we're going to do something. Let's do what, you know, what God tells us, in, but the equipping. So we equip. Why God brought the men and women in this house as, as teaching your children in the back and leading worship up here and doing all we do is to equip people to do the work of ministry, to go out and make sure this thing gets done well, until the whole body be built up. Amen. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We'll never get mature until we all get together on this. If you start thinking to yourself, well, you know who does the work in the ministry? Pastor does the work in the ministry, and David does it, and Joseph does it, and Maris does it, and Tony does it, and Cindy does it. They do the work of the ministry. No, no, no. We do the work of the ministry. And we train you the best we can to go out and do it. That's why I say you pray for people. You go to the hospital and pray for folk. Amen. You lift them up. You, you make phone calls to folk. You, that's what we got to do. We got to stay in touch with one another. Can I get an amen? Givers live with the presence of God or because of the presence of God. Now, I got to move fast here. Amen. Uzzah, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 10. Uzzah dies touching the ark. You remember the ark a couple of years ago? I, I brought in an ark of the covenant here, and we talked about uh, a, a, a guy named Obed-Edom. Amen. He, they, they came in with, with the ark, and, and the, uh, this, the ark was on a cart. Amen. Being pulled by oxen. The oxen stumble. Uzzah, Uzzah reaches out, touches it. God strikes him dead. There he goes again. God's got this thing about, come on home with me. Knocked him down. David saw it, stopped the parade. Grabbed the ark, dropped it off at Obed Edom's house. Eda, Edomite, Edomite. These are the enemies of the Israelis. So David drops it off at his house. I don't know if David dropped it off thinking maybe to kill him too. You know, but drops the ark off. And the scripture says this. He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he, he took it to the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom the Gittite for three months, 90 days. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. If you remember any of those messages, Obed-Edom was blessed, blessed, blessed because he was in the presence of God. Amen. Anytime you get in the presence of God, giving becomes part of your life. Amen. He just started giving. Nothing changes a life more profoundly than seeing an impossible situation develop possibilities. Let me say it again. Nothing changes a life more profoundly than seeing an impossible situation develop possibilities. You know, when I saw Pat walk into church after going through the, the seizures and all things he went through, that was an impossibility. Amen. But to see it develop told me that nothing was impossible. Nothing was impossible with God. 
You love the ark, the presence of God. And here it is, guys. God's presence will bless your life abundantly. Stay in his presence. Wisdom, you get wisdom, direction, favor, protection, blessing, healing. Fact number two, the presence of God will mess you up. The presence will mess you up. Your old ways won't matter anymore. What others think of you will fade into obscurity. Old plans will no longer matter, and all that matters is walking in this presence. Give you another fact. Our proximity to God is directly proportional to our productivity for God. The closer I get to God, the more productive I become. The more productive I become, more fulfilled I become. You know, I saw somebody, right, get, get I won't mention names, Emory, but they said, you, you quit basketball. Was it basketball you were playing? You quit basketball. You could really be happy. And I thought to myself, you know, I played sports in school, and I, I limped today. And I enjoyed sports. I did. But what you're doing now will far exceed any basketball award you ever got. Amen. Because you're going to continue using something. And the closer you get to God, the more productive you become. Then watch, the more fulfilled you feel. I feel like I'm doing the right thing. Jesus taught us, given it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. God said, let me go tell you something. You can use a spoon or a shovel. You pick. You can use a spoon in life or a shovel. You can spoon out a little blessing to others. You get it spooned back. You want to use a shovel? You get it shoveled back. I've seen this and proved it over and over in my own life. It just keeps happening. And I don't give to get. You shouldn't give to get. We give to honor God and other people. But the one thing I know is when I see a life that's been born again, they become givers. They give their time. They give their talent. They give their tithe. They give their treasures. Amen. And, and this is the, and I close with this. And it's out of the message. Just let, let it say what it say. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your mind what you will give that will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in his giving. Because many times that's what you hear. Somebody come and give you a sob story. And then you just start chunking it out. Come here, twist your arm, tell you all going to hell if you don't give. Bryce, that ain't what the word said. God can pour on the blessing in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving, ways never run out and never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can, uh, you can then give away, which grows into full form lives, robust in God. Wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. So everything we do brings us back to praise to God. But let me back up to verse 10 here. The most generous God who gives seed to the farmer. I realized in my life that it was God that gave the seed. It was God that blessed me. Amen. I've said it for years. If he can get it through you, he get it to you. Amen. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. Amen. He doesn't want to take away from you. Heads bowed, eyes closed, across the building. Lord, when I read uh, about Ananias and Sapphira, whew, there's something going on in that early church. You're bringing judgment back to the house. You're setting things right and the hearts of the people right. God, my prayer for this house, for everybody that's here, is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to realize that by our giving, we've made a life and a legacy. And it will be remembered. The stars that shot across the universe that were here for a little while and then gone. Lord, our lives mattered when we were on this earth. 
God, a spirit of taking has moved across our country. Yeah, it's moved across our world. People feel like they have a right to take. Lord, they are lining up with an army of Satan. God, help us to break that and just be the people of God and to give back, to be a blessing to others, to release, to let go. God, to find a way to find others to be a blessing. To those that are needy, God, also those to the house, we bless you. We thank you. Change our hearts, our minds in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Come on, give God some praise in here. Hallelujah.